Everybody might want to remember to mute too if you're not speaking so that the background noise doesn't share. No, go ahead. My thing is acting up. Go ahead. Sure. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Black Health Trust weekly program. We're so pleased that you have chosen to empower yourselves today by joining us. It's great to have a regular our attendees back and those new to the program. My name is Janelle, and I am your hostess for today. I hope you all are doing well from wherever you're joining us from. Today, our panel will be moderated by the distinguished Dr. Randall Maxey, Chief Medical Officer of Advanced Community Medical Care Corporation and President and Founder of Black Health Trust. He will introduce his terrific co-moderators co and guest presenters today. Black Health Trust was founded in response to the global pandemic and Dr. Maxey's desire to keep his own family safe. And fortunately for us, his commitment evolved into a much larger vision. The purpose and mission of Black Health Trust is to provide credible insights from our community health experts to best serve our communities of color with a coalition of leading and long-standing Black medical professionals across a diverse spectrum of disciplines to offer unvarnished opinions and insights into our physical and mental health during these challenging times. These opinions are offered to help educate and inspire you to take your health seriously and to ask questions of your own medical practitioners. Now I'll go on to share a few housekeeping items and announcements for the program. This video conference is live and is being recorded on different public platforms such as Facebook Live and YouTube. Your participation in this program is completely voluntary. And if you choose to participate and prefer not to have your image and likeness displayed, there are visual and audio settings on your personal device that you can use to block your picture and mute your voice. That said, all participants will be muted by our Zoom technician initially. We ask that you remain muted until the host or moderator asks you to contribute. That is in an order to minimize the distraction of background noise so that we can give 100% attention to our speakers. Check and make sure that your device is on mute, please, until you're called on to speak. And then once again, place your device back on mute when you're done speaking. With regards to the chat room, if you have questions, you can enter them into the chat room. Please limit your questions to two per topic being addressed and please do not use this forum to advertise or promote your products. Understand that there may not be sufficient time to get to all of the questions, but we will certainly do our best. Please note that the information communicated on this program is not intended or deemed to be medical or legal advice, and you should always consult your own medical or legal professional for advice and direction pertaining to your particular situation and needs. The information presented here is not advice, but rather opinions and recommendations from credible sources. Black Health Trust, its representatives, members, employees, attendees, heirs, assigns, and guest speakers and presenters assume no liability whatsoever in connection with the information presented or used by anyone, nor are these discussions directed to specific situations. Again, we strongly encourage all attendees of the program to consult their own legal or medical professional for conclusive guidance on how to proceed in your own professional, or I'm sorry, your own personal circumstances. We're in this together. If this program has been valuable and interesting to you, please visit the website to learn more about our programming and how you can support Black Health Trust so that we can continue bringing our community outstanding content. Visit blackhealthtrust.org. We want to thank the Black Health Trust Steering Committee, the Executive Board, its virtual administrative assistant, our production and Zoom technician, 
Black Health Trust supporters, and all of the people behind the scenes for their time and efforts that make this program possible. Let's now welcome all of our distinguished physicians and special guests. We thank you for sharing out your valuable time, information, and educated insights with us today. Your participation and support help to empower our communities of color, and this is critical to our present and future well being as people. Black is beautiful, and knowledge is power. Welcome again, everyone, to the Black Health Trust weekly program. This is our community. This is our time to take care of our health. So lean in, everyone. Dr. Randall Maxey, please do us the honor of beginning today's program. Thank you very much, Janelle. Uh, I'm Dr. <laughs> Randall Maxey, and it's my pleasure to welcome our distinguished uh, panelists and speakers uh, today and welcome my good friend, Dr. Ron Bailey, who's been today's uh, producer. Uh, you'll hear from him shortly. Uh, I'd like to also welcome my most distinguished uh, uh, partner and moderator, uh, Dr. Ivan Walk Walks, who is a former commissioner of health for the city of Washington, DC. He's been advisor to presidents uh, such as in George W. Bush, advisor to Governor Tommy Thompson, who at the time was Secretary of Health, and many other numerous things that he may be modest, but I'm asking him to introduce himself and to begin our panel today, uh, the distinguished good brother, Dr. Ivan Walks. Good morning and good afternoon to some of us who are on the Eastern side of the, of the country, as am I. Um, Thank you, Dr. Maxey. Um, I am not good on introducing myself. However, I will say a few things based on Dr. Maxey's request because I've learned over the years to always do what Dr. Maxey asked me to do. So um, a, a couple of things about me. I am a psychiatrist. I did a fellowship. I did my training at the University of California at Los Angeles in neuropsychiatry. I did a fellowship there in transcultural psychiatry. I um, was a member and I also I was a commissioner of mental health for the county of Los Angeles a long time ago. I also served on the board of trustees of the American Psychiatric Association, was editor of the Jefferson Journal of Psychiatry, completed a, a senior primary care uh, fellowship at the Department of Health and Human Services when a member of the Board of Trustees of APA. I have been the um, uh, Commissioner of Health for Washington, D.C. and uh, completed leadership training at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. So I think that's enough. There are another five pages, but um, I think that's enough. Uh, the most important thing about my, my background is that I've known um, Dr. Ron Bailey for a long time and really admire and respect him. I'm really excited about the panel today because um, any friend of, of Ron Bailey's is someone who I would really love to get to know and really love to learn from. So let me go through our statistics for today and then we will get on to uh, Dr. Bailey and to the rest of the folks. So our COVID-19 tracker, we uh, every week go and get the most current data from CDC. And as of uh, yesterday, last night, 8 p.m., the total U.S. cases, 29,552,459. Total new daily cases, 61,627. Total U.S. deaths, 538,261 of our fellow Americans. Uh, total U.S. daily deaths, 1,527. And Go, total vaccines administered 121 million thus far. So we are well on our way. May I have the next slide, please? And um, we're, we're looking at the race and ethnicity of the people with at least one dose administered. Um, and we can see that there is still a significant uh, disparity. Um, <laughs> black non-Hispanics are only 7.8% of the folks who have gotten vaccine. And um, as I'm fond of saying, uh, don't tell me about vaccine hesitancy until you've offered me a vaccine and I've refused. That's when I'm hesitant, not when I'm having a conversation about whether or not I should take it. That's not hesitancy, that's a conversation. Um, next slide, please. 
And the we've had some conversations about the um, death tolls and death rates. And um, I think Dr. Sherrod had brought to us, brought to our attention that um, all public health is local and the Los Angeles County total mortality rate that we're looking at per 100,000, we can see that uh, the rates are not the same across various uh, groups. We can see that African-Americans have a rate of 185 per 100,000, um, Latinos 333 per 100,000, uh, white Americans, um, white Angelinos, only 117 per 100,000. And we can also see the really critical impact that poverty has on those rates. So as we've felt, as we've known, and now as the science shows us, the rates do differ from location to location. The rates do differ in many locations across ethnic lines, across racial lines. And we have to make sure that our watchword is equity. So I think those are all the slides. So I would like to move to saying a couple of words about uh, my friend, Dr. Ron Bailey. Uh, Dr. Bailey has more initials after his name than there are letters in the alphabet. It's M-D-D-F-A-P-A-A-C-P. Dr. Bailey serves as the Assistant Dean of Clinical Education at Charles R. Drew University and Chief Medical Officer of Kendron Health Systems Incorporated. Dr. Bailey's career has focused on treatment of the chronically mentally ill, forensic violence assessment, and health disparities. He has served as president, the 113th president of the National Medical Association. He has 54 publications that address healthcare disparities, including the books, quote, A Doctor's Prescription for Healthcare Reform, and quotes, at gunpoint, end quotes. For his extensive work addressing health disparities, he has been funded by the National Institutes of Health, NIH, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Care Services Administration, SAMHSA, Area Health Education Centers, AHEC, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, RWJF, and the Snyder Foundation. Dr. Bailey's work has been a landmark work for many, many years. And so we are very excited on the Black Health Trust program today to have Dr. Bailey leading our program and bringing with, a, with him a distinguished panel of experts. Dr. Bailey, please take it away. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ivan Walks. I'm very appreciative of your comments and opportunity to uh, join uh, Black Health Trust today. Uh, I'm a regular uh, participant and listening weekly, and I've learned so much about um, how all of us, especially psychiatrists, should understand and address like, the COVID-19 crisis, I think, in our community and all communities. So I commend you and Dr. Maxey and others for, uh, for this work. But I'm extremely excited that uh, Dr. Maxey uh, invited me to bring uh, this group to you today. I hope we'll bring great value, I think, to your group. Uh, about three years ago, uh, Springer Publishing came to me and asked uh, that we write a book on uh, intimate partner violence uh, to distinguish it from domestic violence, but to address particular communities that have historically uh, struggled, I think, in these areas and are disproportionately adversely affected. Uh, we took that challenge on, and I'm actually extremely excited and thankful uh, for the many co-authors who joined me in this work. Uh, five of which I have today who uh, you'll get to hear from. I'm going to give brief introductions uh, of each now. I'm going to give some comments, uh, some, show some slides, and then we'll have each one of them in order. Um, uh, following myself, we have uh, Dr. Kathy Grinnell. Uh, Dr. Grinnell is a um, 1990 graduate of UTB Med School in Galveston. She's currently a practicing child psychiatrist in, in Houston, Texas. She's the author of the book, The Economics of Parenting. She's a former professor at UT Houston Med School and currently serves as the director of a behavioral health management company uh, in a national role. And she's starting a new business soon uh, entitled the Training Propensity of Solution uh, starting in May of 21. Uh, you'll hear more about that here shortly. Should be followed by um, my coworker, uh, Mark Townsend. Uh, Dr. Townsend is the George C. Dunn a Professor uh, and Executive Vice Chair for Adult Psychiatry, Medical Education and Residency Training at the LSU School of Medicine. Uh, he and I have crossed paths in many regards, and currently he's the chair uh, in the American Psychiatric Association of the LGBT Caucus of the APA Assembly. Uh, he'll be speaking about LGBT issues uh, today. We're very happy to have uh, Mark join us with his expertise. Uh, he'll be followed by Candace Mason. Uh, Candace Mason is an orthopedic surgery uh, resident physician uh, in Los Angeles at LA County Hospital. 
She's a 2017 graduate of UTB Med School in Galveston, Texas, where she had honors as the Osler Honor Society recipient. And she was a member of the uh, Alpha Omega Alpha, our most distinguished medical society uh, in medical schools. I look forward to her comments. Uh, she actually has chapters in two of the books that you mentioned earlier, one on health disparities in 2013 and one health disparities dealing with gun violence. So she's definitely an expert in health disparities. We're talking today about IPV or my partner violence. Should be followed by Dr. Conte Terrell. Uh, very happy to have Dr. Terrell with us. Uh, she's a PhD in counseling uh, and, and support. Uh, she's a domestic violence recovery specialist. She's the founder and CEO of the Fresh Spirit Wellness for Women. And she'll be speaking today about uh, upper SES individuals and how many historically thought that that group um, did not suffer from the risk of domestic violence or IPV, uh, but very often they do. I look forward to her comments today. Uh, and should be followed, our final speaker will be Dr. Dasha Guyan. Uh, Dr. Guyan is a, a PhD psychologist in Houston, Texas, a professor of psychology at Prairie View School um, uh, College, uh, and chairman of the Mayor's Task Force in Houston of the Office of Drug Control Policy. Uh, looking forward to a very good group of speakers today, and we'll move right on to our first slide. The first slide really should address uh, the fact that in 2018, the Office of Violence Against Women within the US DOG changed the definition of domestic violence. The new definition, domestic violence is limited to physical violence, neglects other forms of domestic violence. So we've already begun with a construct of how do we define this issue? Because I think uh, behaviorally, many have not had a full understanding of what's representative of domestic violence, I think, in our society. Uh, such really qualifies the level of physical violence and that which rises to the level of a felony uh, uh, choice concern. Uh, it was it it respective of coercive control, threats against the individual, verbal or psychological abuse that's absent from the definition. Next slide. Uh, these abusive tactics uh, really impact a victim's quality of life. Uh, coercive control and threats can create an atmosphere of helplessness. We learn in psychiatry about what's called learned helplessness, the animal model of depression. The reality is human beings have the same structure, the idea that a person can put you under such pressure and such stress and such fear that one won't do the things that you normally would do. It affects how you think, let alone how you feel and how you act or behave. So the victim's self-confidence can very often affect their personal wealth, worth, or self-worth in such a negative fashion it impacts them in a non-physical fashion, very similar to if it was actual physical abuse. The reality is these non-physical actions can be very difficult to identify, but are problematic nevertheless. Next slide. Um, during the colonial period, a long, many years ago in the history of domestic violence, the British law was standard, allowed husbands to have all this absolute control over their wives, uh, wives were considered domestic uh, chastisement or corporal punishment was allowed until the mid 1900s, uh, really less than 100 years ago. This rule of thumb existed where a man was allowed to physically assault his wife or what have you, a domestic partner, as long as the, um, the stick he was using, for example, was no thicker than his thumb. Uh, in Jordan versus Jordan in 1862, the ruling read the law gives the husband power to use such a degree of force as necessary to make the wife behave herself, uh, quote unquote. So the reality is we've got historical law. Our government implemented policies that actually implemented these types of st strategies. And many of them, unfortunately, even though the laws have changed, have continued throughout our society over time. Next slide. Uh, victims now have access to protective court orders and other legal protections. The law allows for interventions of minimal participation by, by victims. Policy changes over the years, you're more allowable for prosecutors, judges, policymakers, and police to protect victims regardless of the victim's wishes. And often that has to happen because at times, because of the emotional entanglement that some other speakers will address today uh, as well, a uh, victim may be a person who might um, not know what they want to do. The police may come to help them. They may actually pull back and say, well, no, don't arrest uh, my uh, spouse or my significant other, if you will, because it may uh, harm me financially and other, other aspects of my life. So changes in the legal system have followed but changes in how we treat individuals may not have, and in some communities, this is worse than others. Next slide. So federal statutes really have aimed at addressing gender-related violence. So the act was created funding agencies offering support for victims of domestic violence research. In 2000, about two decades ago, the Battered Immigrant Protection Act was introduced, created these uh, visas and U visas and T visas that provided protections to undocumented victims of abuse and human trafficking areas, I think, of mistreatment and inhumane treatment of other people. The fear of deportation, very often was eliminated, so persons would cooperate with authorities 
in a fashion that would create less hinderment of pursuit of concerns that were actually uh, adversely affecting them. And any pending litigation regarding immigration deportation was potentially, I think, put off to really push, I think, an adequate uh, and optimal reaction response to this issue of the Violence Against Women Act. So we really want to understand these new laws and implement them in a fashion that's actually optimal. For all the physicians and healthcare professionals on the line, it's essential, I think just absolutely essential, that we know what the laws are and use them to the betterment, I think, of our patients. Just some note about where the person can see the slides. Let's make sure they can see the slides. Next slide. So in 2000, the Violence Against Women Act was broadened to include more protections, I think, for Native American persons. Uh, about 40 to 60 percent, 70% of Native American women experience IPV in their lifetime. Violence against Native American women are perpetuated by non-Native American men, different culturally than some other areas. We hear a bit about African American women, I think, later today, and more about Hispanic women when we give our next talk uh, on, on April 18th on, on the same program. In 2013, about seven years ago, the Violence Against Women Act allowed tribes to enforce laws regarding domestic violence perpetuated by non-natives. Uh, they could not do so before. So the laws have been, have been, been in many regards, helpful, but also hindered certain groups from having protections in, in this area. Also in 2013, that particular act added protections of the LGBT community, uh, which uh, Dr. Townsend will discuss. And this ensures access to all services and protections by LGBT community victims of domestic violence. Next slide. So this slide just kind of points out that uh, there's active effort, I think, by advocacy groups, the, the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill, the NAMI, the Mental Health Association, and very often in certain subcommunities, groups that I think particularly focus on different subgroups to stop the violence. So we think that there should be more active discussion. People shouldn't be afraid or hide from these concerns. And they really should, I think, push the envelope to really get the message out. Uh, I think very often a public acknowledgement of, is much more likely to be beneficial to decrease, I think, these um, uh, individual mistreatments, I think, of, of persons who are vulnerable and likely to be victimized. Next slide. So it's criticism of this Violence Against Women Act, uh, 2013 version uh, caused more underreporting of abuse, some thought. Underreporting may have started to take place with the institution of automatic arrest policies in some communities. If you call, the police have to come out to the home and take the, perpetu the perpetrator, very often a man, away from the home. Some don't call the police or authorities for that particular reason, which creates quite a, a conundrum, I think, in many communities. Many don't want to see the abuser arrested, so therefore they don't report the abuse. Um, and very often this uh, addresses re uh, concerns regarding how do we prevent abuse if persons won't call and seek uh, professional help. So communities that are afraid of the police and against government authority have very often found this conundrum of how actually to respond as best possible to protect women very often in these settings. Next slide. Homicides, uh, very often uh, these issues are not simply limited to assault, but actually uh, fatality. Uh, the Gun Control Act and federal legislation controlling firearm owners, uh, the Lautenberg out of New Jersey, Lautenberg was a center that produced, introduced restrictions on ownership, possession of firearms of persons, very often men, who have been, victim, who have been uh, perpetrators of, of domestic violence or IPV against uh, their typical others or the women in their lives. This act extended gun prohibitions to non-felons if they had been convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence or of an pending restraint order against them at that time. Uh, so I often make the point that we talk so much about taking guns away from the mental yield, uh, but the data has shown in our society over throughout the entire of my career, the three groups who are most likely to use a gun, for example, to hurt someone are individuals who've done it in the past. They're often the uh, domestic violence that I'll be discussing today. Individuals who have been victims of violence, individuals with SUD or substance use concerns. So we should be mindful that our laws should follow the data. We should be empirically based on how we create policy to protect, I think, our citizens. This is a huge issue. We limit, li limit not limit, but limit homicides in our society if guns are taken away from persons who have been non-fatal in their violence to a significant other in the past. Very often this violence is progressive, it starts small, grows to moderate before it becomes severe. Next slide. We also have what's called the battered women syndrome, uh, describes the mental state of the victim of abuse. Victims become apathetic, depressed. We mentioned learned helplessness earlier, uh, despite, I think, negative consequences of the relationships. Three key tenets. The victim believes the abuse is their own fault, sense of fear for safety, and believe that retaliatory violence is inevitable uh, after disclosure. So people are so afraid of being retaliated against, they don't go and tell to, to move, make maneuvers that would prevent the further abuse. Next slide. And this, I think, is a pictorial of the construct of a person, very often a woman, uh, being in fear and really feel like she has really nowhere to go 
and not knowing how you can ask for help and not be retaliated against. Next slide. Mandatory reporting. Only a few states have mandatory reporting. I make this point earlier. We actually miss the concern. These are individuals that we can find ways to limit, I think, this exposure. And we can enforce reporting, which brings more people to justice. We think over time this would actually help curtail abuse. Opponents are kind of against it. They can block victims from health care. The AMA actually opposes mandatory reporting. Next slide. And physicians can be fined. Uh, statistics, uh, total blood prevalence about um, right at about 1% uh, across the full spectrum. 22% uh, of women, 40% uh, of men have been either a victim, struck by a weapon, kitched or punk, punched, or intentionally burned, and violence brought to at least to injuring women. Uh, most common ages are uh, late teens and early adults in their third and fourth decade. Next slide. Even rape up to about 10% of the time. Here's our final slide here is further considerations. Law enforcement should be uncertain to proceed in cases involving same-sex individuals as well. We should uh, have a high index of suspicion and move progressively to limit abuse. Perpetrators, I think, should be thought to be um, uh, the larger two individuals. Not always. Sometimes a smaller person may be uh, causing, I think, the other uh, violence. And heterosexual couples often assume the male is the aggressor. Not always the case. So the key issue is for us to be thoughtful of as we move forward. Next. So I'll end now and I'll move straight to Dr. Kathy Grinnell. Uh, her topic is going to be domestic violence in the African-American community. Dr. Grinnell. Well, I needed permission to unmute. Thank you for that. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate um, the Black Health Trust for doing this and inviting us to be here. Uh, and thanks to everyone who, who has joined us today. I am the author of Chapter 5, Domestic Violence in the Afri African American Community. Is it, are the slides up? Thank you. When we look at the incident of IPV, we must recognize that the definition itself may change from administration to administration. For example, during Obama's administration, domestic violence included sexual, physical, emotional abuse. However, in the Trump's administration, it only included actions considered a misdemeanor or a felony. So therefore, the incidents for domestic violence ranges from 25 to 71 percent. And again, it just depends on the definition. Intimate partner violence is one of the many types of domestic violence. And for today, we will focus on this, IPB. This is indeed a vast topic, but I do want to share a few pertinent points on IPB within the African-American population. The rate of IPV amongst minority populations varies greatly, especially when you're trying to determine which minority group has the highest incidence. However, if you compare white women to African-American women consistently in the literature, African-Americans have a higher incidence. The CDC survey from 2019 found that one in four African-American women and one in seven men experienced at least one episode of IPB that was serious enough to report. Women who are physically abused are often abused in multiple fashions, including psychologically, sexually, or via stalking by their partners. Surveys have also reported that African-American women, more commonly than white women, experience rape, physical abuse, and stalking. 45% for African-Americans and 35% for um, white Americans. And some, some of the literature has African-Americans as high as 53%. Lastly, we must not forget how deadly IPV can be. And some studies have shown that African-American women are two times more likely than white women to be murdered as a result of IPV. Next slide. One of the major concerns in the African-American community is the lack of reporting of IPV. 
and Dr. Bailey spoke to this some, there could be layers of reasons for this. But one of the most commonly mentioned is the commitment to protect the family at all costs. This cultural attitude may have its roots embedded in the trauma of family separation during slavery. The goal of keeping the family intact may lead to African-American women tolerating the early signs of IPV and the more subtle acts such as verbal abuse, pushing or shoving. This cultural attitude could also lead to African-American women remaining in the relationship even to the point of death. Next slide. Let's turn to some of the risk factors for IPV. Rangel and others in their study looked at the relationship between marijuana use and intimate partner violence. They found an increased risk of marijuana use and IPV amongst the, amongst the adolescents and young adults for African-Americans, Hispanics, Asian, and white population. There are also studies that show a high incidence of alcohol use in both the, the victim and the perpetrator in IPV. Poverty and low socioeconomic status has also been identified as an increased risk. And lastly, institutional racism. I'm not sure if any of you have seen that the Procter & Gamble video entitled The Look which shares the numerous microaggressions an educated middle-class African-American male faces in one morning of his life before even starting his workday. This type of adverse experience day in and day out often adds to the negativity brought to the home. If we add on top of this mistreatment by the local police, a lack of respect in the workplace, and all of that comes home daily to the spouse, you can only imagine the response that is needed. Now, if we have a spouse who understands and maybe is going through some of that themselves, they may be able to soften the blow. However, if the spouse themselves are under the same type pressures, the two may not be able to support each other. Next slide. Needless to say, IPV with all of its complex layers has been linked to several mental health conditions which are listed here. The next problem, however, is the stigma in the, in the African-American community for seeking treatment for mental health conditions. And then of course, there's the lack of access, the lack of healthcare insurance, so in the African, African American community, all of these health disparities only compound the risk of IPV. Next slide. So I do have some good news. I don't wanna leave us with just the bad news uh, because there are some positive and protective factors that we can find in the African American community. Yes, religious activity comes to the rescue. Attending church, marriage counseling, and mentoring, fostering children, and education have all shown to lower the risk of IPV amongst African Americans. Most African Americans, as per a national survey, are of the Christian faith. And studies have shown that just attending church on a regular basis can decrease the prevalence of IPV, substance use disorder, and mental health disorder. So of course, it is not too surprising that during 20, 2020, when churches were closed due to COVID, the numbers for IPV, substance use disorder, and mental health disorders did increase. Next slide. Who seeks help from whom? First, the studies indicate that over 50% of African-American females will talk to someone about their experience of IPV. Maybe a friend, could be a clergyman, maybe a medical doctor. 
but it's rarely the police or a mental health provider. When you may ask, do African-Americans go to the police? Stalking is the most common IPV act reported to the police by African-American women. Also, important to note that educated African-American women are more likely to seek assistance from various sources, including the police, and are quick to request a restraining order when necessary. The literature does support that African-American women are more likely to seek assistance from the police if a stranger sexually abuses them versus a partner. Next slide. Interventions are so important for lay individuals and professionals. If given the opportunity to intervene, we must first remember that fatality is a possible consequence of IPV. Thereby, safety is the number one concern. As a lay person or medical professional, we all should have our list of local entities that offer safe housing and support. For me, that is Fresh Spirit Wellness, founder Dr. Conti, who you will hear from shortly. Fresh Spirit is located both in Texas and Atlanta. But we all should have a list ready to provide. For medical professions, during the assessment, it is important that we take a trauma-informed approach and remain calm so that the victim can feel safe and feel you can handle what has been shared. Contain the space. Avoid asking too many questions, which may lead the victim to feel judged or re-traumatized. Show that you care by showing compassion. Self-care is important and it is a prerequisite for professionals so that you are not impacted negatively by the abuse shared experience. In addition, you may be the only example for the abused person to offer them a source uh, and education about self-care for themselves. Lastly, help the abused develop coping skills that foster resilience and to establish positive relationships that will foster rebuilding resilience. Thank you. Next. Next, we will hear from Dr. Townsend. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so happy to be included here today. As a gay white male physician, I always look for invitations to speak about issues that affect other LGBTQ people who do not come from places of as much privilege. And I thank you for being able to talk about this today. To set this up a bit, this is a focused version of the chapter that Dr. Bailey and I wrote together for the book. And it will include some theory, some statistics, and wrap up with a call to action. So if I may have the first slide, please. So minority stress theory, don't know if folks know about the idea behind minority stress theory. It was, it's a way to understand how various life events and also the mental representations, the anticipation, the anticipation of negative life events can affect. This theory was developed among LGBTQ people, but it's been expanded to other minorities, especially marginalized members of minorities in the United States. So the main things to keep in mind, the main things that I think minority, minority health, uh, minority stress theory inform us is to have people experiencing IPV to be able to look at them and try to figure out what areas of, uh, of discrimination are affecting them for real? What areas of discrimination do they think could be uh, going to affect them? And also what areas of discrimination they fear, they fear may be going to happen that haven't happened yet or they don't know will happen to them. 
how this is important, and I'm going to focus a, a bit more on this as I go forward with my, my, my few slides here, is the issue of intersectionality. Intersectionality is when one inhabits a social role, more than one, more than one minority, it's often thought of, it, and each, each one of the minority statuses, each, 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 each part of the person in that intersection can add to the minority's stress. And there's some data that I'm sharing here uh, coming from Fenway Clinic, at, at, at least in that clinic, there's thousands of people, thousands of database, black sexual minority women reported greater scope of discrimination. In other words, what they were experiencing for real that was affecting them was broader. And they reported that the psychological effects from it were worse than comparable white minority women or black sexual minority men. Can I have the next slide, please? And as, as I'm saying, just to elaborate a bit upon the factors associated with minority stress, that can fall most heavily on the shoulders of people standing in that intersection. So anticipated adverse events like employment, housing, healthcare, dining and lodging, being asked to leave, being denied jobs, fear of being outed. So keeping in mind that people at this intersection often, tell people about the aspect of them that they think is less likely to cause harm and, and most likely to allow them to go forward in whatever situation they're in. And sexual minority status is often something that is kept secret. And so protecting that from being known is one a big aspect of anticipated minority stress in that population and acted things like hate crimes, things like actually being fired not being allowed to be hired, actual discrimination, enacted discrimination. And then this bottom category, which is often talked about is internalized homophobia. I do not mean here to blame literally the victim. It's just that many people with minority status, and this seems to become more of an issue for people holding multiple minority statuses, begin to take a piece, a piece of society's negative view about them and they hold it to themselves and that can hold people back. And how this particularly affects today's talk is people experiencing IPV might be much less likely to seek health because they, they know in their hearts ahead of time that they're not going to be respected or taken seriously in part because they themselves are having trouble dealing with some aspect of their minority status. Have the next slide, please. This is also a, a way for me to plug Fanway. Sexual assault doesn't discriminate by race, orientation, gender, identity. Why am I plugging the Fenway Clinic? They have done a beautiful job of having gender inclusivity built into the forms, the forms that people use to register for the clinic, the forms that healthcare providers are using when they treat people at the clinic. So, so please, please don't think that gender and sexual minority inclusivity at the level of a form is not a big deal because with data, with data, you can change the world. Some of the information that I've already shared today has come from the Fenway Clinic and it's available just precisely because the forms that they use make people feel comfortable or allow them to record data about themselves. That can be very helpful. Next slide, please. One of the things that affects the ability of LGBTQ people experiencing IPV is their invisibility. They're often not seen by first responders. They're often not thought about by the clinicians who treat them. They're, they're simply not viewed correctly. There's not a lot of data on, on these communities. It's less understood because there's not a lot of data. And then we have these burdens, us as good-hearted, educated healthcare providers. Still, we, like everybody else, are burdened by society's notions, by US society in 2021's notions of how men behave and how women behave and how couples should be. It's something that I think all of us have to step back and examine. And it's, it's in many ways similar to the broader anti-racism effort. What is it we're doing and why are we doing what we're doing? And how is it 
we're not bringing everybody to the main stage. What, 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 are, what are we going on with LGBTQ survivors, victims of IPV? What's going on that they're, they're being missed? Next slide, please. Bisexual, women who report as bisexual are the largest, largest group of sexual minority people. And it appears that African-American bisexual women like African-American trans women seem to be bearing the brunt or more frequently reported to have experienced IPV. IPV is, is, is rather common. It could be up to twice as common in LGBTQ populations. And how it affects bisexual women most is in relationships that are heterosexual, at least with opposite sex partners. It's the opposite sex male partner that's more likely to perpetrate violence on a bisexual woman that's less likely to occur in same sex relationships with bisexual women. Although, as I say, the data are terrible. And there's some reason to think that actually bisexual women in same sex, as same sex couples, the uh, domestic violence that it can occur is, is more often emotional than, than physical. But uh, violence is, is violence, abuse is abuse, and uh, we have to be able to recognize it and stop it. We have the next slide, please. So transgender individuals, uh, talk about data that is hard to come by and hard to trust completely when you get it. I think situations say data that Fenway collects, even though it's what, what we call in the field snowball methodology, it's just stuff that's there in one spot is precious stuff because there's so little that it is known precisely about this community. It does appear that Couples, so we're, we're talking about trans couples, two trans, two gender non-conforming people, as opposed to same-sex women couples, same-sex male couples, and then heterosexual male female couples. Of those four groups, it does appear that couples of transgender, gender non-conforming couples are the most likely to experience IPV. It's more common than with any of those cisgender couples. And it's also highly likely that it's underreported. Uh, let's just take one little bit of this and going back to the intersectionality. So the usual way that IPV is, is disclosed is to a primary care provider. Well, here we are. If a, a, a transgender woman of color is often living in a community that has less access to primary care, who is she going to speak to? And then there is plenty of evidence that trans people are less trusting of physicians or might be less likely to self-disclose anyway. So right there, you have two strikes against somebody having the easy ability to talk about their abuse. And then here's information that has gotten quite a bit of attention. And I do want to say that the, the data here is, is also scanty, but it does appear that Black trans women are at most risk of, of, of of serious harm from IPV. They're more frequently murdered than other trans, than individuals in other trans communities. And their deaths are more, more frequently described as overkill, way too much forced to, to, to use. Killers of, of these women are less likely to be convicted. And incarceration rates for African-American trans women are higher, and they're more likely to be sexually assaulted in jail when they are incarcerated. The next slide, please. And as I say, and as I will say in a, in a bit, I believe we can all do something to encourage reporting for LGBTQ domestic violence. Next slide. So let's talk about gender specific area issues. As I say, you, you could, if you wanted to think about four types of couples in which IPV is occurring, and that is really a, a artificial construct anyway. But if you could just, just sort of bear with the idea, talking about same-sex women couples, same-sex 
male couples. So we are in a clinical setting or we're first responders responding to some violent episode. So clinicians might not even be looking, might be less likely to look for violence among same-sex women couples. But the idea here is that even, even we as clinicians fall for 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 bias, right? we 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 buy the notion that women are somehow more uh, nice to each other and and less likely to be violent. When in fact the rates are still quite high in, in same-sex women couples, and the perpetrator has every reason not to have that be known as the perpetrator in any couple. And then when it comes to same-sex male couples, there's this bit that sounds a lot like, "Oh, boys will be boys." So they're beating each other up. That's one thing. And the second thing is not recognizing that these two men are actually in a relationship. And uh, now we have other things about gender roles that come into play here. But it's back to what I, what, what I, what I talked about internalized. These are internalized issues that it, it does appear that some men in same-sex couples who are experiencing violence, remember, have all these hoops they have to get to anyway to speak to somebody who they trust to disclose to are less likely to because some of they feel that, all right, I'm in a relationship where I'm being beaten by my boyfriend's partner, spouse. Uh, uh, that's really weak. It's, it's something I'm ashamed about as a man and I'm certainly not gonna talk about it. All these ways that gender roles can get in the way. Next slide, please. And then homophobia, again, it's, please look at this as, the, uh, the discrimination that happens specifically to gay people, LGBTQ people, internalized homophobia is what we say to ourselves that keep us from, from reaching out to, to, uh, to getting assistance. And then here's some more information from the Fenway Clinic. There was a questionnaire that was given to 200, 200 lesbian women and many of them said that they just didn't trust the, their service providers. These people who are usually there to provide help they just not feel that they were going to get anywhere by telling them. This is at the Fenway Clinic. They weren't going to get, it, uh, get anywhere telling them about it. Next slide, please. A bit about the law. And thank you, Dr. Bailey, for especially opening my eyes to some of these issues. As you've already said today, it was not until 2013 that the Violence Against Women's Act was brought in to include lesbian and transgender people. There's really gotta be more at the federal level than there is, as I will see in the next slide and anticipating that because I don't wanna hear the two minute warning. Anticipating that, I, I do wanna say in general, it's state law is a patchwork of advice in many of those states, sometimes purposely, sometimes by legislative fiat, don't offer the ability for same-sex couples, LGBT couples, trans couples to be protected. They, they do not have the same sorts of protections. Next slide, please. Oh, here's an example. In the state of Montana, gay people, trans couples are, are just, are, are edited out of the whole construct. You, you, can't, you can't experience intimate partner violence in Montana, if you're queer, which doesn't happen here. So lack of federal guidance leaves everyone at risk. Next slide, please. This is my call to action, very simple, very kind of quiet call to action. Research into IVV prevention among queer populations has got to be funded, got to be conducted. Not a lot has happened since 2015. Of course, that could have something to do with the administration that was that was there during part of that time, but that's not all of it. it it's these these couples, these the, the, this violence needs to be understood better. So we as clinicians can help fix it. And when you see someone at an intersection because they're carrying multiple minority statuses with them, please don't help them cross to the other side. They don't need to go anywhere. They're precisely where they need to be with all their minority statuses. We have to support them and we have to make them realize their potential. But in order to do that, we have to give them the ability to discuss their minority statuses and to recognize and respect their desire to disclose or not disclose. And as I say, 
if we do gender inclusivity at every level, both on the forms at intake and as we speak to patients, we're gonna get a lot of data right there. And believe me, every bit of information about how we address IPV in queer populations is really, really helpful. And this does dovetail with all the work that I hope all of us are doing, being mindful of racism and encouraging our colleagues very patiently all the time, not letting it drop, that they have to work to undo racism. And then also if any of us get a chance to work with, with people in the front lines like clinicians or, or people law enforcement who are often inappropriately called into people's homes to help figure out what's going on, if we have an opportunity to help them understand, to work with them, to partner with them so they understand IPV and LGBTQ issues, please let's go ahead and, and, and join them and, and help them understand so that the communities can all be safer. And I thank you very much. That's my slides. Uh, this, is, this is Dr. Walks. We have one question in the chat um, for Dr. Townsend, if we could just um, jump in with that one. And uh, the question in the chat is, uh, Dr. Townsend, could you explain the behavioral differences of each letter in the LGBTQ acronym? Uh, so far, I have no clear comprehension <laughs> of the meaning of these letters. I think that would help those of us who are heteronormative, straight, et cetera. Also, what is cis male or cis female? Uh, Dr. Thompson, would you mind? Happy to. Thank you. Of course, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. There's also, Q can be double Q, queer and questioning. Uh, all these communities, I, I have to tell you, I feel more and more comfortable talking about queer communities, identifying myself as queer because that is such a mouthful. And because it's kind of a, you know, get up there. I'm not, I'm not the spring chicken I used to be. It is something that younger LGBTQ people address and are trying to make normative the whole word queer, hey, we are all in this together. We all can be mutually supportive. Each of us as a sexual minority is a little different from non-sexual minority people, but that's it. And cisgender is meant to, it's, it's folks who uh, have, uh, are living as straight couples and are comfortable, like born women who remain women, no surgery, no augmentation, no hormones. It's people who are going with what they got. Those are cisgendered men and cisgendered women. Trans men and women are people who are, uh, the idea is that they are transitioning in any way they feel is helpful because somebody's transition is their business. Not everybody has so much as, as hormone therapy, much less surgery. But trans people are people who are kind of working with the stuff they were born with and are, are working to make it work better for them. That's, and, and cis people are the rest of us. May I ask uh, two questions, Dr. Townsend, quickly? Of course. Uh, uh, question, from a cultural standpoint, the word queer uh, makes you more of a minority than normal. Is there a different word, a better word than queer? How I know, doesn't it remind you of some other ways that communities define themselves that seem offensive? And I, I don't know whether, as I say, is it, is it me as a, as, as, as a gay white male doctor, do I feel more comfortable embracing that word because of, of, of the relative privilege that I bring to it? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's, 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 I tell you something, it's not, not the happiest word to use. And, and the, but nevertheless, there's not at this point an umbrella, a simple to say umbrella that everybody who's a sexual minority one way or another can embrace. I have to tell you, I, 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 I was still coming to the idea that sexual minority, it sounds so, I don't know, kind of sexual. But again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a broad tent. We all know it's a broad tent. And, but there has to be a word that everybody in that tent, all the stakeholders can, can hold on to. But something that isn't repellent to the, to the society that we need to lift us up and get us to where we need to go. So it's a problem. And, and I'm, I'm, I'd, I'd be happy to hear people's suggestions because, man, I'd, I'd love to move beyond it myself. The, the last question, I read a book a few years ago called Sexual Apartheid, uh, written by a good friend of mine. And 
it made me understand a bit more about human development. But could you briefly discuss, uh, is there any relevance anymore to Klinefelter's and Turner syndromes? And if you could just break that down. Well, you're, you're, you're inviting me, Dr. Feltz, to go off script here. I, I don't wish to offend, but it is nevertheless thought that a genetic, a genetic anomaly is always a, a, a sexual, is always a disorder. And so uh, people that have different genetic makeups, even if it's not affecting them, it's, 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 they're, 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 they're variable. Genetic variables are always considered non-normative, but I'm not talking about genetic variables. And I'm here, I'm talking about social roles more, more than that. So in a way it's apples and oranges, but yes, indeed we, we do work because many young children are, are, are very much affected by their genetic anomalies sexually. And, and it does need to be addressed and identified, especially early on. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Townsend. Thank you, Dr. Maxey. Dr. Bailey, I was I was going to hold my question until the end because you are orchestrating this so beautifully with all the slides in order. But I have to ask you, one of the things you mentioned when you were talking about the uh, lack of, of reporting and folks not calling the police with these issues, from everything from experience to an episode of Blackish, the TV show, we know that black folks don't call the police on black folks because we call them for something little and they wind up killing the person that we call them to help. And so can you just say a little bit about that particular part of the psychology of black folks that there are a lot of reasons why we don't report stuff, but one of them is that the police brutality thing is really an issue. I think you're exactly right. And, and I'll be brief. I think the next speaker may actually address some of these points as well, but clearly, I think Dr. Walks, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, whether we talk about gun violence, uh, domestic violence, or any of these concerns, there's this conundrum that ethnic minority communities have, I think none more so than the black community, because of this fear that law enforcement in general are not always, uh, very often they're dichotomized. Uh, they may come in a way that may actually harm or take away the bad individual who's doing a bad thing, but they may harm you as well in the process. We talked earlier about the secondary adverse effect. If a woman, for example, calls because her significant other is harming her, if, if they take him away, he can't go to work on Monday. There's no paycheck on Friday to feed her children uh, on the weekend. But another very issue is she doesn't want to see the police come and mistreat him and, and hurt him and, 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 and violate him in some way. Uh, I think this, this group knows that I've known Kathy Grinnell a long time. She spoke first and she taught me something in med school 30 years ago, decided that in many black communities, people are afraid to call because the police will harm or kill the black boy in the street. This idea that they would do it publicly, which very often is remarkably symbolic of all these bad things that happened over, over decades and years, lynchings and public you know, mistreatment to put fear, I think, in everybody else in the community. So I think that this is a huge struggle and, and we don't have a great answer for it. We think that public education we're doing today is a start and we gotta find ways to change policy and to change leadership of government entities, law enforcement and, and district attorney offices that don't allow police free reign to hurt people, I think, in our communities. Yes, thank you. And, and, and in particular, Dr. Townsend's last slide, part of his call to action was for us to involve ourselves when there's an opportunity to do training or to interact with folks who, who, who maybe we can help to understand the different communities that they're serving. Okay, Dr. Bailey, I, 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 didn't, wanna, I didn't wanna interrupt your flow, so please go ahead. You're on mute still. You're right. Next we have Dr. Mason. Can we help unmute Dr. Mason, please? There we go. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Mason. Can you pull up my slides, please? Okay, perfect. You can go to the first slide. So the purpose of my talk will be to explore the role of the healthcare provider in identifying and aiding victims of interpersonal violence or IPV. 
In particular, what I want to focus on is to highlight some of the common physical and behavioral clues which victims of IPV may exhibit, and therefore to help empower the informed healthcare provider to identify these signs and symptoms, to facilitate effective conversations, and ultimately to help these vulnerable patients to obtain safety in their living environments. So a little bit of introduction, healthcare providers are uniquely positioned to interact with these patients suffering from IPV. We're stewards of closely guarded information regarding health, substance use, and sexuality. Therefore, these patients, you know, although they're coming to see us, they might be hesitant to talk about love, domestic behavior, and perpetrators, in addition, may keep the victims in feelings of isolation with use of suggestion and coercion. Therefore, the doctor's visit may be the only opportunity for victims to speak privately and candidly about what's going on in their um, intimate uh, social environments. Next slide. So opportunities for healthcare provider to address IPV. It's been shown in multiple studies that 15 up to 70% of women report having experienced IPV over their lifetime. These victims seek medical attention at rates higher than the non-abused. Victims are three times more likely to seek treatment in the emergency room. And this puts a healthcare provider in a unique position to investigate and to address IPV. Next slide, please. So some of the common uh, symptoms that they might show up to an emergency room or an office visit that could kind of highlight and clue the provider that this might be going on. Uh, many victims of IPV have reported victim uh, symptoms of gastrointestinal complaints. Up to 30% of patients reported functional GI disorders had a history of rape or incest. Next slide, please. In addition, GU health. So common complaints are gynecological symptoms such as pain during intercourse, decreased sexual desire, vaginal bleeding, pelvic pain, UTIs. This likely arises from undesired sexual intercourse and sexual activity and physical trauma that these patients might be experiencing in their home. In addition, women are two times more likely to be hospitalized during the antenatal period. Again, this is just kind of the same uh, sentiment. These patients might be exhibiting um, symptoms related to IPV in their household, related to unwanted sexual um, experiences and unwanted pregnancies as well. Next slide, please. So some other signs of IPV. Consider possible IPV if patients come with atypical or otherwise unaccounted for pain or dysfunction. Annually, 40 to 60% of women in violent relationships sustain injuries to the face, neck, and chest. Consequences can be anything from injury, disability, or to loss of life. So this can lead to serious um, consequences and serious flights of morbidity. So it's very important for the healthcare provider to be tuned in to what's really going on with their patients, to ask the best questions and to really effectively communicate with their patients. Next slide, please. So some behavior and clinical signs. These victims may request multiple visits for the same issue. They may report very vague complaints. They're not able to really describe what's going on. They just have pain or they're just not able to function well. If the victim is seen with their partner, they might note that the partner is aggressive or speaks for the patient. In that case, it might be helpful for the provider to ask their partner to leave the room while they examine and get a history from the patient themselves. These patients often can present after a delay of the injury. They can often present with multiple injuries or injuries in different stages. That's one of the common things that we learn about um, in medical school. I'm an orthopedic surgery trainee. We often learn very commonly with um, patients. They might have multiple stages of healing injuries, children and women experiencing IPV. So that's one of the things to really look out for if they have multiple injuries and they're not, maybe they might not even have a good reason as far as why they have these injuries. That should really clue you in and to ask further questions. Next slide, please. IPV presentations. So history of substance use and self-medication can be very prevalent. Uh, we're gonna talk about more of that in a uh, further coming up talk, but that comes up very often. Often different psychiatric complaints as Dr. Grinnell mentioned, anxiety, depression, PTSD, suicidal ideation can be often very prevalent in these patients. And it also raises the question of, are these patients having anxiety, depression, mental illnesses because of the IPV, or do these um, psychiatric conditions come before the IPV? These patients might have symptoms, feelings of low self-worth, you know, low self-confidence, and that may lead them to have more, or uh, be more likely to engage in relationships that are violent or abusive. So these psychiatric issues in IPV often go hand in hand. Next slide, please. 
substance use again, 40 to 60% of married or cohabiting patients entering treatment for substance use disorder reported one or more episodes of IPV in the year prior. In addition, half of IPV victims indicated the abuser was drinking before the act of violence. And what's even more concerning, when examining inmates convicted of killing their intimate partner, 45% indicated drinking at the time of homicide. And I think in that same study, there noted that they had three times the upper limit of the legal drinking blood alcohol concentration when these instances occurred. So substance use is definitely very important in this talk, but it goes more into a, a further coming up conversation. Uh, so I won't go too much into detail with this slide. Next slide, please. So some barriers to screening. IPV is often not explored during visits or doctor's office office hours. So why is that? The Institute of Medicine identified IPV screening as a critical and necessary procedure for women of childbearing age. However, the provider may not be familiar with IPV or its vast medical consequences. In addition, providers may feel time constraints. You know, they have to do the physical exam, they have to do the history and move on to the next patient for financial incentives. So that all of these can lead to barriers to screening. However, I think as healthcare providers, we have the unique position to affect change, to really have effective conversations with these patients. So it might take a few extra minutes, one or two extra minutes, but it might be life-saving for these patients. Next slide, please. A little bit of statistics about IPV reporting. Only 29% of women who experience IPV have had a discussion with their doctor. However, 74% of these women know that they initiated the conversation. That's a pretty staggering statistic. I really want that to hit home with us. Only 29% of women had a discussion with their doctor, but of those women, 74% of them initiated the conversation. So that really speaks well to how we can do more as physicians to help these uh, patients. Due to embarrassment, shame, or discomfort, doctors may not feel that it's appropriate to initiate the conversation. Also, women suffering from IPV are more likely to report switching doctors because they do not feel satisfied with the care that they received. So this is just really a call to you know, healthcare providers that we can do more. We definitely can affect change when we see these patients. If we can put the clues together, we can help them. Next slide, please. Also some cultural impacts are very important. Providers should be sensitive to culture-based attitudes of IPV. The abuser may use cultural norms to justify continuing perpetrating these violent acts. Acts that fall under the umbrella of cultural norms can be things as marital rape, dowry-related deaths, exposure to SDIs. Again, some of the uh, talks that Dr. Bailey mentioned as far as marital-related rape is very prevalent in these patients. And it's very important when the conversation that you're having with these patients as well, and when they might try to normalize the behavior. Next slide, please. creating the setting for disclosure. So it's very important to discuss confidentiality and the limbs of confidentiality with these patients. Be mindful of possible deterrence that victims may face before disclosing abuse and address them as appropriate. You know, we discussed before financial incentives. The patient might feel that it's not appropriate to disclose IPV because they don't want the abuser to go and be able to pay their rent the next day create a comfortable, supportive environment for the victim, and also take adequate measures to ensure privacy. Next slide, please. So ways to approach victims directly with care. Take an active approach when addressing issue of abuse. Ask specific questions rather than vague inquiries. I think that's really important as well. The patient might feel that not very comfortable talking about it, but if you ask the right question, if you ask very specific questions that might lessen the blow a little bit and they might be able to answer more appropriately in that instance. Assure that the victim of abuse, that you are here to listen and that they can expose as much information or as little information as they feel comfortable. It's better to create assurances that discussions can be had when they're ready rather than forcing it upon them. That's also very important as well. If the victim is not ready to disclose, then you should just leave it at that, provide adequate follow-up and let them know that it is a safe environment. So when they do feel that they can share, that you're ready to listen to them. Next slide, please. And speaking to victims of impersonal violence, when asking about abuse, avoid stigma and avoid judgment, of course. Accept denial as valid and continue to offer support. 
this patient just might not be ready. They might not be ready to face uh, what's really going on with them, or it might be legitimate. And so then just provide support as you can. Let the victim know that they are believed and that their suffering is valid. And also reinforce that they deserve a safe life free of interpersonal violence and that this outcome can be achieved. Next slide, please. So some special considerations. Always inquire if there are children in the household, if the status of their safety. Offer supportive information such as hotline numbers and support agencies. And a little uh, tactical uh, way to do this is to provide a small, concise card with valuable information so that the patient might be able to easily um, hide this information from their abuser, but use it when they're ready to use it and when they have a safe exit plan. A healthcare provider should not demand that the victim leave their abusive partner, of course, because of all the reasons we discussed before, but just to provide support, provide them with information. I think that's one of the most important things that we can do. Next slide, please. And then transitioning from abuse. Of course, it's a long process. They need a safety plan and they might need time to make these changes. The victim will need plan to execute time to execute a plan. Uh, you can also just always provide them with continuous support. Many times life changing concessions need to be made before they're able to execute this plan. So always just them with the um, valuable resources that they can use as they make the plan can be a very um, useful plan for us as providers to help them. Until the abuse is resolved, however, the provider must ensure the victim's safety and the safety of their children as well. Thank you very much. Yes, well, thank you. I think there were some questions in the chat. We're gonna go straight to Dr. Mason. I think one dealt with what are some referral sources that a doctor could give uh, to a patient in these settings? And another, I think, addressed issues about um, when do you involve law enforcement or the police? Yes, May of course. So Dr. Bailey, can I add a question to that group? Absolutely. Are there any tips for de-escalation? Uh, I tell people when people are intimate, they know how to push each other's buttons. So how do you de-escalate that situation? Definitely. So I think some valuable resources could be um, battered women and children resources, um, violence hotlines. Um, all of those could be things that could be very easily transferred to the patient that they can use when they're ready. Um, and it could be a very discreet thing for them to use. Um, I think the second part of the question was when to involve the police or official um, law enforcement. So at least I know in California, the mandating reporting is for um, abuse of children, elders, and dependent adults. Domestic violence doesn't necessarily fall in that category. Um, however, it's appropriate to facilitate social workers, um, facilitate other aspects of care that can help these patients reach safety. Um, so that would be my best plan um, to help these patients. I wouldn't go straight to the police myself. Um, I would involve social workers as other aspects um, for helping to get these patients to safety. Um, and then as far as, um, what was the last question? I forgot the last question. About de-escalation, are there some tips for couples uh, to de-escalate IPV? Yes, definitely. I think that also goes back to Dr. Grinnell's um, last slide. Um, so things such as um, effective communication, um, having a, a good plan in place before these types of things uh, can occur, um, and also substance use. We saw the staggering statistics about how prevalent these um, issues can be when there's substance use uh, in play. So maybe tactics such as decreasing the amounts of substance use in the household, um, when there is substance use in the household, avoiding or, you know, taking that person, taking them out of the picture altogether, if they feel that something might happen later on, if their abuser or if their partner is using substances, I think all those could be helpful tactics for that person as well. And um, let me just, uh, so this, this has been just, just wonderful as we're, as we're going through, and I think there's so much good information. Um, there's a there there's an old saying only fools rush in and i think 
sometimes when someone comes in and you can see those signs and with all the learning that we've done this afternoon, we can't wait. I don't, ask someone who sees people that have these issues, that shouldn't be my first question, right? Oh, hi, I'm Dr. Walks. Let me ask you about your abuse. I think that there are, there's something about that art of medicine piece where we want to make the person feel that we are caring. We're just not trying to hear their story. Can you speak a little bit about how you get to the point where you ask that important question and get that really important data so you can help? Yeah, no, definitely. I totally agree with that. That goes all back to the, you know, developing rapport with your patient. This is your first time seeing the patient. How do you develop rapport with them? How do you initiate the conversation? I think it's more of a outside going in approach. So I would start with very, you know, general questions. How are you doing? What's going on with your health? Maybe talk a little bit about why they're coming to see you. They might have very specific complaints. You know, they might have a bruise. They might have an injury to their arm. Talk about that. They maybe talk about how did this occur? You know, can you describe what happened? They might have very, you know, like we discussed earlier, very vague complaints as well. Maybe ask them to describe really what they're feeling and why they want to come and talk to you. I think the more you get them to talk, the more comfortable then they'll be with you. And then you can start honing in and asking them very specific questions. All right, thank you so much. If we don't have any other questions, I'll let the next speaker go. No, absolutely. And I, I just want to uh, um, you reference Dr. Grinnell earlier. She had made some points, I think, regarding how different groups respond differently to these type issues or items. I wanted to kind of go to her before we go to the uh, next didactic by Dr. Terrell. Dr. Dr. Grinnell, would you want to comment about that issue of how um, ethnic minority groups uh, respond different in some settings? And I guess we're giving advice to the audience on what they might do in a setting. One person in the chat, for example, asked about use of rating scales or, or, um, or um, uh, objective techniques. Sure, thank you. I was not able to um, unmute, but I appreciate um, you all helping me with that. Um, first off, I, I would say in the midst of the um, couple, um, fine, first, first, let me back up. Let me say to our to those viewing that when you see the, the red flags early on in the relationship, you know, perhaps before it gets to the point of uh, dependence on that person, that I think when people show us who they are, that we should uh, believe them. And so uh, to those who are coming in contact with this type of um, relationship early on and you see signs, things happening that scare you or make you uneasy or make you uncomfortable, then that is the time to truly stop that relationship. Now, once we're into it, I, I think, I agree, Candace did a very good job. I mean, I have worked with some women who would not, could not see how to leave. And so all you could do with them is just support them, uh, be there for them to um, uh, at least voice their concerns with you, even though they were not able to get out of it. And I've seen some, you know, years pass and it, and it ends, it, it goes away. I've seen some talk their uh, significant other into coming into therapy, for example, with them. Um, Sometimes they won't, but sometimes they will, and they'll do it, um, you know, it may be to control, but sometimes that can help make a difference. Uh, we talked about some of the protective things, getting them to go to church with you. Uh, if you are spiritual, uh, in the midst of it, you know, um, if you see it heating up, of course, we all know, you hear their voice going up, you want to make sure yours is going down. And one thing we know about psychiatry, somebody getting agitated, if you have food to offer, offer some food. If you can get out of there for that uh, quickly, then get out. Um, it, I mean, there is, no, it's, there is no one thing that, that could work because it depends on the circumstance and what's happening, but there certainly are some tactics. Um, what, what comes to mind with regards to tools, and I, I see somebody put, um, an aging life screening to save an aging life screening to. I know there are some tools also with regards to 
um, childhood adverse um, uh, experiences, you know, the ACE study, there are different uh, tools that are, uh, you can find on that website that will um, allow them to, in a non-judgmental way, share some of the experiences they've had throughout their lives. And of course, you can utilize that in their treatment and in, in shaping and helping them to get to the point that they can either leave or or sometimes get to the point where they can change or alter what's happening in that relationship. Um, that's all I can remember that we talked about. But <laughs> well, that's excellent. I think that the audience uh, just really wants to have some uh, progressive, um, tangible deliverables of how you go forward. I think you make a point very well. I I'm like you. I'm not a child psychiatrist as you are. I do forensic psychiatry, but I think our, our areas overlap. Uh, it is difficult, but not impossible. I think having a good relationship, as you point out, I think is key and, and giving a person some options and make sure they can actually kind of come back to you to talk kind of going forward. So I, I appreciate those, those, those answers. I'm going to move next to Dr. Uh, Conti Terrell. If we can load our slides, please. Who can also offer us some solutions. <laughs> well, hello, everyone. Um, Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Bailey for having me here uh, today and to the Black Health Trust for this opportunity. I am uh, Dr. Conti Terrell, as he said, and I am the author of chapter 10, uh, Transcending Socioeconomic Class. Uh, slides, please. So in my introduction today, I wanna to talk to you about the things that I will be sharing in my slides. And we really wanna dissect the financial disparity and how it affects those who are affected by domestic violence. Women's jobs, typically thought of to be domestic uh, in nature since colonial times. Husband's jobs, viewed as the garnering, uh, garnering wealth for the family. IPV includes financial control. It robs the victim of the ability to escape abuse in many cases. And financial inequity, inequity may keep victims uh, with their abuser much longer than they would like to. And it causes them to return to the abuser uh, much often and more times than not. Next slide, please. It is clear that many people don't understand why the abusive relationship continues and the abused often returns. Many people place blame on the victim for returning by suggesting that the victim even likes or thrives on the abuse, which could be no further from the truth. I speak to you as a domestic violence recovering expert, but also as a survivor of a marriage to a 10 year physically and emotionally abusive ex-spouse. The attitude of many is that if they don't like being abused, then they would leave and not return. We're gonna talk about so many reasons why the women or men in many cases uh, do return to abusive relationships and the extreme complex that has less to do with the content of the woman's character and more to do with the effects of the abuse. It's widely known as uh, that the abused woman leaves on an average of seven to eight times before actually, actually leaving permanently. And we do know that financial dependence is a huge part of that. Abusers often are empowered by the victim's financial dependency. Autonomy of the victim is restricted. The abuser definitely does not like for the abused to have any type of independency or self-sufficiency. After separation from the abuser, there are many other needs that need to be addressed. 
uh, food, housing, health care, child care, transportation. There's so many other things that take uh, into consideration. And so these are often things that the victim is thinking of when they do leave, if finance is one of the issues that is keeping them there. Next slide, please. Financial dependency. Many women today still financially depend on their partners. Childbearing, rearing keeps the woman away from work and forces prolonged periods of, of absentee from work and not being able to actually have finances and financially be independent. We talked about, um, uh, uh, one of the, uh, Dr. Walks talked about, uh, he had a, a, a saying and I can't remember what it was, but it, it was speaking to jumping into things too fast. And so typically a lot of times I often tell my clients that healthy love isn't fast, it's slow. But most of the time when the abuser wants control, they quickly encourage you to uh, let's move in or let's get married or let's have a baby, uh, let's start a family. Because these things often keep the victim more dependent on the abuser. A, a woman may feel even more trapped in the abuse if her children are being provided for. Abuse reduced or prevented when a woman becomes less vulnerable and active in the balancing of power within the relationship. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. That slide just shows you the female asking for uh, funds from the male. Oftentimes we know that finances are uh, used as a control and a weapon for the abused to con comply. Financial dependence, main causation factors for women returning to abuse. Where am I gonna go? Where am I gonna sleep? How am I gonna support myself? Oftentimes people say, well, why don't you leave? I have a joke. I said to my clients, the next time someone asks you that, ask them, will they take you in? <laughs> Can you come and stay there and sleep with them? Per uh, the perpetrators of abuse exploit partners to maintain control, causes partners to be late for work, behave inappropriately at partners' place of work to get them fired purposely, Partners may steal the car keys to keep the victims in the house, allocate only meager amounts of money. Uh, there was a particular time when uh, I had a, a client at this particular time, uh, Fresh Spirit was doing sessions on a sliding scale basis. And the lowest amount was $25. And thank God we have received grants and now that we don't charge anything. But this particular client one day at the end of our session, was pulling out her money to pay, which was the lowest on the sliding scale of $25. And she gave perhaps like a 10 or five or one, and then like some, some quarters. And so uh, I asked, how are you paying for your sessions? And she said to me that she was paying for the sessions with her money from, that was given to her for groceries. And so what she would do is that she would buy something that wasn't name brand or that was on, on sale or on discount. And then she would take the, the balance of what it would have you know, cost her and put it aside so that she have her money for sessions. So, of course, this was because she was extremely controlled by her husband with the finances. She was not even like many women able to purchase the necessities without getting permission, asking for the funds, uh, even feminine products or cosmetics, vitamins, and even medications sometimes are withheld or the funds are allocated meagerly and meager amounts with um, control of the abuse uh, by the abuser. Next slide, please. Financial dependency. 
It is thought that it would give greater ease, more options to leave the abuser. Employment leads to social support in the community and the workforce. A lot of times, if you're able to have employment, which is highly discouraged against when you are with an abuser, you're able to take advantage of some of the benefits, which may include counseling. Help for reducing uh, or escaping IPV if the victim seeks help. Having financial independency will help her be able to do so. Prevailing assumption is that the economic empowerment is a potentially protective factor against IPV. Although I will speak, however, lately to later to that as well, that that is not always the case. Next slide, please. Relative resource therapy theory. Risk of IPV is high in high earning women. It is presumed that male abusers with limited resources will use violence to maintain control. So what if the woman actually is allowed to work or is the breadwinner or is the one that is actually bringing in the majority of the funds? So this causes the abuser to use a different type of control, maybe physical control, because his dominance and his masculinity can be threatening to her. Critics say that theory neglects culture, gender views, and generalizes men's behavior. Although culture and gender does make a huge difference in how the abuser chooses to control and how often they choose to control the victim. And it is a choice. It is absolutely by design. So many people think that this is as a result of anger and can't control themselves, but this is absolutely by design. Higher socioeconomic status appears to be protective against IPV. Possible inherited biases, IPV among higher earning earners are underreported. And Dr. Bailey spoke also about underreporting. If I am a female CEO of the company, founder or president of an organization or the, the head of the department, it is more unlikely that I am going to want to report that something so devastating or embarrassing to the woman, oftentimes shameful, is happening to them. Next slide, please. Gender equality. United Nations assert economic empowerment of women is protective against IPV. Scientific consensus is economic empowerment protective against IPV. Economic empowerment alone, not enough to protect those from IPV. It really is not. Increased awareness and education is needed. Oftentimes, women don't even realize that they're being abused, and particularly if it's financial abuse. A lot of times women think that the, the, the model of just being submissive and that they're just being a good wife and they're just helping the husband or spouse or mate maintain the, uh, the finances and the bills if they just don't say anything and, and go along with the fact that he is issuing, issuing out funds very meagerly. So education and awareness on the behaviors of the abuser is extremely important. Next slide, please. In conclusion, IPV is pervasive. Socioeconomic conditions associated with increased IPV if a woman achieves higher education status, wages independent, is less likely to be victimized. However, as we've said, we do know that that is not always the truth or the case. It really depends on how the victim chooses to use his power and control. In areas of low education, mere financial empowerment is not enough to be the sole protection for a woman who is being abused and who is experiencing IPV. And that's it for my slides.
Any questions? Dr. Bay, I think that we had um, one in a chat that talked about, do you think that work from home options, and uh, we're seeing a lot of that now with these hybrid work arrangements these days uh, due to COVID-19 uh, pandemic or the crisis, uh, one positively come out of it is for us to have a better chance to figure out uh, where, where to be. I do think that um, uh, if somebody at home more often know, it does change the dynamic of what happens when you're at home for a longer period of time. Could you really speak to that and how some of these changes that a person's at home more regularly, uh, even with kids at home more regularly, which kind of changes the family dynamic, how that may actually increase this risk of, you know, uh, working, uh, higher functioning, and very often, you know, higher uh, SES women. And that's an excellent question. Prior to COVID, we encouraged women to get jobs from home. Uh, I mean, even things such as dog walking, something as minor as that, that the abuse would not know that they were actually going out and receiving funds. These funds could also be transferred uh, digital, digitally into an account that they would never even have to know about. But because of COVID, it has become extremely hard. And we know that domestic violence has risen and IPV has risen uh, over 40% during the COVID time because the abuser is actually at home with the victim, which makes it even more complicated to try to do some type of work from home. Now, also, we have to remember that this is about power and control. And so the abuser finds many ways, whether it's to track the cars, whether it's to, to uh, track uh, phone conversations, bug the phones, to see if there's any outside opportunities going on where the victim is actually seeking work or abilities to make funds available to her. However, yes, working from home, anything that one can do to gain some type of financial uh, increase in their status would be very, very beneficial when it comes time to leave. Oftentimes they don't have a place to go, which is why it's very important uh, for them to have organizations such as Fresh Spirit and other organizations that may be in your community that we need to let them know that it doesn't always have, they don't have to have the money all the time. We have programs that will allow them to stay in hotels. We have programs that will allow them uh, of the ability to to receive food and some other necessities that are barriers keeping them within the abused relationships. Right, well, there's no doubt about it. I clearly think that um, communities have to know what their um, the resources are. Um, much of today's discussion has revolved around how each community um, may have uh, different strategies to take some may uh, go to a, a typical uh, resource, uh, the police or law enforcement. Others may have to be cautious in that regard and use other resources uh, proactively. I do think that uh, information education, I think, is key. And I clearly think that uh, groups like ours have a capacity, or uh, we, we, we work together on, the thing, on this, this, this item, but to write more and to keep this issue, I think, in the forefront. All too often, uh, I saw one slide, I think it was Dr. Mason that pointed out about shame and, and embarrassment and humiliation. Dr. Conti's point that if you are higher income and a higher professional um, uh, working woman, for example, if you're the CEO of a company, what have you, you may be even more embarrassed than others to acknowledge that in some settings, you're in this uh, less than optimal or less than powerful position that might put a person at a greater degree of risk if they stay in a harmful uh, environment. So I think these are messages that I think we must be um, proponents of, but pretty consistently. I think that the um, other key issue for us finally, though, is that I think in addition to writing about it, we, we've got to be proactive in our approach and make sure that we communicate this message throughout other uh, mental health and, and healthcare type of organizations. Dr. Walks. Uh, Dr. Bailey, thank you so much. I, I know we are we are getting close to to time, and this is so great. Let me ask the question: Is there a national clearinghouse? Is there a single place that all of the folks here can look to find out what's available in the local communities across the country? Well, there is the national hotline, of course, is 1-800-799-SAFE, uh, particularly if you're trying to give someone uh, a, a general place to call and to get help. 
Uh, but then each community, as you said, if you just uh, Google domestic violence abuse in my uh, demuse, abuse agencies in my community, you'll get a plethora of lists of organizations that are in your community that are helping uh, provide services and particularly safety plans. And, 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 and speaking of safety plans, since COVID, safety plans have even changed because typically safety plans are how to leave the house. And since COVID, safety plans now may be how to stay protected and safe in the house. If you right. begin to be abused or if the abuser began to uh, become aggressive, don't go into the kitchen or to the bathroom where we have hard uh, marble sur surfaces and tile surfaces, things of that nature. So all of these things are important and you definitely need to check out all of the community resources so that you can be sure to send them to a place that are offering these services. Dr. Bailey, uh, I have a proactive question. As a uh, father whose daughter was recently married, uh, I was brought up under the old school way that whenever your daughter brought home a prospective man to be married, you'd conveniently be cleaning your gun every time he came by. Uh, in light of that, how can you advise couples in choosing and dating that could prevent bad choices? It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous point. Uh, I, I do think that, uh, you know, you make uh, light of that issue. And I think it's funny, but it's actually very true that um, what, whether we um, are conveniently cleaning our gun or not, we definitely want to ensure that we project the message of family support. Uh, oftentimes, human beings that are harmed or mistreated, and I think even uh, Dr. Mark Townsend talked about this, I want to have viewed as being vulnerable and easily marginalized, somebody might try to isolate them, you know, not talk to them or keep them from talking to their family and pull them away from other sources of support uh, emotionally and, and, and verbally, as well as physically, that might leave them vulnerable or more vulnerable to being victims of abuse and then not feel like there's a, a, a way out, so to speak. I think that uh, the other issue that you point out that I think is very salient is um, we all have, I think, responsibility to ensure that the individual who may be a victim was our daughter or not, knows very loudly and clearly and, and viscerally that we as a family are there to help and protect them and, and support them. Uh, I love that old phrase that it takes a family or community or village is I guess a better term. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I grew up in a community uh, in Beaumont, Texas uh, years ago where uh, persons helped other persons you know, down the street or next door in a variety of ways and, and that may sound old school and a bit vernacular, but I think you know, there's a lot of truth to it. And it probably in some regards decreases the likelihood that when somebody is on the verge of thinking about hurting the, the domestic partner, the intimate partner, whatever, they may not. Because when the domestic partner feels comfortable going to the next door neighbor, knock on the door saying, Mr. Jones, will you come over? You're know, having a problem over here. That may be very different than calling a police 911 or calling a, a detective or a lawyer or a bigger source of engagement. So I, I think you really speak volumes, Dr. Max, in this idea that we have to regularly be creating an environment of support for persons who may be vulnerable or marginalized, whether they are uh, our, our, um, our, our daughters or not. Um, I think that um, I mentioned Townsend. Uh, Mark, would you have any comments about that? Dr. Bailey calling me out to finish your sentences. No, <laughs> no, sir. I, I, I tell you, I, uh, I think especially living in New Orleans, which is a, quite a dangerous city, not only just COVID, but there's many, many things that could keep us in our houses and not reaching out to other people. And, and I, I, I tell you, there's, a, there's something to be said for living in a community of like-minded schools. So uh, sometimes neighborhoods can be of great help if people to feel comfortable with their identities enough, especially if you're a sexual and minority, their identities enough to self-disclose and be able to partake of communities of other people who are also uh, sexual minorities. I think it does take a village. And I just want to add to that, um, um, Dr. Maxi was asking about how to be you know, more proactive. Uh, a lot of times we think about the red flags 
But what we miss is, or what parents miss or uh, friends miss, we miss the not so red flags. If, if they come home with a black eye, we absolutely say, no, this is not the person for you. But if they come home and says, well, you know what? He said, I don't think, he don't think I should really finish college that I won't have to because I'm gonna be married to him and he's gonna provide for me. That's a not so red flag. So there are other things that we have to make sure that we are educating the young couples or any couple on. Uh, and again, it goes back to taking your time. Uh, and not moving so fast, getting to know the individual in all seasons. I always say it's four seasons. God puts us four seasons in this world, on this earth. And so just imagine how many seasons an individual will go through. Take your time and see all those seasons. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good point. I, I do want to squeeze in that uh, we listed a, a, a sixth speaker today, a Dr. Guyan, a good friend of mine. Dr. Guyan is a uh, hardworking psychologist who works in a hospital on weekends, and he was actually working. Uh, we changed our date. He worked this weekend, so he had to uh, miss today. We're going to bump him to our next date, which is April 18th. I thank Dr. Max again for giving us a second date, and Guy in his uh, text me that he'll be on on April 18th, so we actually missed him uh, today. But two questions in the chat. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Mason answer one, and perhaps Dr. Grinnell the other. One was about premarital counseling. We can actually speak to Dr. Maxey's point about do we vet people in advance well enough and early enough. Dr. Conti kind of spoke about that a bit. Uh, Dr. Mason is an orthopedic surgeon, and this idea that somebody might see a person in a emergency room with a bone or a bruise injury, uh, maybe right, I think, within her uh, area of expertise. And after I'm asked Dr. Grinnell to answer the last question uh, that we had, which is the one about children. Dr. Grinnell is the one child psychiatrist we have, I think, on the panel. Uh, this issue of how it affects children is of monumental importance, I think, in a community like ours that very often children uh, may be at a greater risk of abuse themselves, but it have to be a tremendous risk of abuse if they're, if they're watching their parent or their mother be physically abused. Uh, Dr. Gr uh, Mason first. Yeah, sure, thank you. I might talk a little bit about the premarital counseling. Um, I, I think that's very, very important um, to make sure that your core values match your potential spouse um, when you're in the dating um, phase of things. Um, it could be simple things such as, you know, just talking about the relationship goals with each other and seeing if your goals match up, or it can be all the way to if you're getting married in the church, you know, having a priest or some clergyman um, do some premarital counseling um, for the young couple. I think those are very important just so that you can really get a sense of, are these two people going to be, you know, a good match for each other? Um, so they can really talk about what their goals are for marriage and for sharing a life together. Um, and then, of course, you know, like Dr. Conti talked about, the really big red flags are physical harm. If someone comes to the emergency room with a broken arm, um, that can be a really big red flag um, that, you know, someone like me would see them in the emergency room. But also the smaller red flags, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, um, you know, just Things of that nature, I think, um, are also very important to think about um, and to realize that it's not going to change um, after the people get married. Um, and so those are very important to make sure that you're on the same page with your potential as well. Thank you. And I will speak, and I appreciate this person bringing up um, the focus on the children. Um, I'll state, you know, the book I wrote on parenting, the economics of parenting, one of the chapters is, um, and it sounds like a book about economics, but it's about, it's about using a system to raise your children. And so um, one of the chapters is when the family hits bankruptcy. And it's speaking of things such as this, um, when there are things going on in the family that devastate the family or that uh, is traumatizing to the family. It's so often, whether it's death or whatever, a divorce, we forget about the children. And just as the parents are experiencing the, the, the trauma and they're under stress and they're overwhelmed and they're anxious and they're afraid, the children are having those same emotions. So it is very important that they, uh, that the parents seek, while you're seeking help for yourself, that you also seek help for the children. It's not unusual in these cases of um, IPV 
when the person does get away, um, you know, when they're able to get away, it is not unusual for them to just crumble at that point. And that's when they need the most uh, uh, mental health uh, support. And in any time a parent is crumbling, you can best believe a child is too. So I thank you for bringing that up. And it is extremely important. And yes, sometimes they learn the behavior and they may uh, exemplify the same type behavior with their, pe with their peers, with their siblings, uh, with their future spouses. So this is something that could, all, it's almost like a legacy. You can pass down a legacy of abuse if you don't uh, get the treatment for everybody involved. So we are we are just a couple of minutes from. I think the, we're done, Doctor Walks. Doctor Belly, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I was just. I think we're done. I I think our, our group today uh, hit hit home runs all the way around. Good good points. Thank you guys for having us and and, and these topics. I turn it back over to you. You, doc, Dr. Bailey, you all have done just a tremendous job. Um, I really appreciate the diversity of the panel, the range of things covered. Um, I'm going to do one little housekeeping point because I'm the one that 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 uh, doesn't understand all the all the doctor words. So when someone talks about gastro gastro in, in, intestinal issues, they mean stomach ache. If somebody comes in, and they've got a stomach ache. It may not be. It may be more than just a stomach ache. Um, the other thing was the term antenatal was used. And that's that time before you give birth, the, pre, the pregnancy time. A lot of folks think that people are really kind to pregnant women. Um, people are not often kind to pregnant women. And I think it's important to ask that. The last little comment I wanted to make is this. So many times we, we men forget that not everybody is comfortable talking to us. And there may be a perpetrator that looks like us. And so making sure that folks are comfortable and if possible, I, I always ask people, are you comfortable talking to an old grandpa? And, <laughs> and I, will, I, will, I will find that, that putting it that way lets them know that they can respond that they may not be comfortable talking with me about certain things. So um, you, you guys are just fabulous and just wonderful. Uh, Dr. Maxey, um, what yes, do you have sir. to close us out, sir? Well, thank you so much. And again, Dr. Bailey and your wonderful panel, I learned so much here. And I'm glad you're coming back in a few weeks. Uh, and I appreciate all the expertise and bringing us all up to date. Uh, a couple of announcements I'd like to make uh, for your providers and other doctors and health people on the phone. I mean, on the call, we have a a call for consultants. We have a group called biometricssecondopinion.com uh, where we can uh, use providers to provide information to our constituents across the country, across the world. And uh, just contact us through Black Health Trust or you can go to our uh, blackhealthtrust.org and see the uh, information on second opinion experts. And we'd love to have you as our colleagues on that uh, in psychiatry, internal medicine, orthopedic surgery, anything that we have, we'd love to have you with us. Also, I'd like to gratefully announce, I've asked uh, Mr. John Sadukas, uh, who has been coordinating our celebrity guests. Last week, we had the wonderful Patrice Russian. Last week, uh, we're asking him to be the special consultant an advisor to the chairman of the board, which is me, and the steering committee, Mr. John Sadukas, who is the founder of the Newport Jazz Festival, the Cool Jazz Festival, and all those he's been with us uh, since the beginning, and we certainly appreciate all that he has brought to the table. And similarly, we have asked uh, Pastor Pointer to join as a special advisor and consultant to our steering committee and letters have gone out uh, to those, those people. Uh, we also have a new website that hopefully is working as of today. And I encourage you to look at blackhealthtrust.org. We appreciate your comments and give us a thumbs up. Uh, if you like us, we'll be back next week. We're gonna open the mics and we're gonna have questions to commonly ask questions about the vaccines and COVID and hope that uh, you join us then. 
And Dr. Walks, uh, you have a favorite person you always like to call when we end our program? I would, I always love to call on Miss Brenda Lee Ager because uh, I've been enjoying her, her music uh, since, since she was young. <laughs> Wait, I forgot one thing, <laughs> one thing. I want to thank Janelle for being our, our, our hostess, uh, Mr. Simon Cooper for being our, our tech, and Ms. Yukini Stevens for being our virtual assistant, and our one uh, moderator who's not with us today, Dr. Barbara Stevens, and our wonderful steering committee. So thanks back to you, Dr. Walks. Ms. Brenda Lee Ager, would you uh, pleasure us with some kind words? I'd be happy to. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm so empowered every week. I want to thank my so personally, all of the music, uh, musicians, I'm a musician, all of the musicians that have spoken today, I'm, knowledge is power, and we just rest in that power and that knowledge. And I'm just going to say just a word of thanks, thanks that we can rest in this truth that we are learning, that we're, that's being given to us by Black Health Trust. And until we meet again, I just want to say, God be with you. God be with you. Thank you, Dax. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Take care. God bless.